Born on May 4, 1951, in Indiana, Robert Allen Deal, later to be known as Mick Mars, had an early fascination with music, which was ignited when he was just three years old. Young Mick was instantly hooked when his parents took him to see country singer Skeeter Bond. But that moment had a huge impact on Mick because he immediately wanted to emulate Skeeter with his big 10 gallon white hat and a rhinestone studded bright orange suit. Mick Mars got his first guitar at 12 years old and did not hesitate to start practicing. By this age, his goal was to become successful in music. When he was 14, he joined a band called The Jades, which was a Beatles tribute band, starting first on the bass and then switching to guitar. Mick Mars was so serious about music that he dropped out of high school, joining different blues rock bands throughout the 70s. But unfortunately, none of these groups found any level of success. His girlfriend at the time, Sharon, got him a job operating heavy equipment in a laundromat in his early 20s. They already had one child together and had another during this time. At night, he was gigging with a band called Watoshi on the local club scene. But after severely injuring one of his hands, he made the decision to pursue music once he recovered. In 1973, he joined a band called White Horse, which played covers. By that time, Mick Mars had honed his guitar skills and his ear, and he would be able to nail complex tunes like Deep Purple's Highway Star, note for note. During his time in the band, he started assuming all sorts of funky nicknames in order to dodge the cops. He had fallen behind in child support, and so anytime the group would get pulled over for even the most minor infraction, Mick would get thrown in jail, and the band would have to scramble to find a way to get him out. Mick wasn't finding success with White Horse, so he split to get into the disco scene in an effort to be able to earn more and possibly find more success. In 1978, he became part of a new wave group called Video New R, which was formed by his roommate and former bassist, Harry Clay from White Horse. It was Harry who said the group looked like a motley crew a name that would resonate with Mick. They released a couple singles, Gypsy Woman and He Drive Me Crazy, and Work Work with Decadence Plus in 79. Both of these singles were Mick Mars' recording debut. They garnered good reviews. With only a thousand copies of the record being pressed, they secured a distribution deal with Bomp Records, garnering a little bit of radio airplay here and there, but the band could not stay financially afloat. In mid-1979, Mick found a job at Triumph Motorcycle Shop, leaving Video New R to join a new band called Vendetta. This band featured vocalist Don Dawkin from Dawkin fame and Udo Durkenschneider, the lead singer for Accept, laying down some backing vocals. This was also during this period Mick made the full transformation from Bob Deal to Mick Mars, dyeing his hair jet black and losing the trademark mustache. To future crew fans, Vendetta's sound is unmistakable. Mick Mars' driving rhythms and searing leads were on full display by this time, and listening to these early recordings shows just how much Mick's playing ended up shaping one of the most successful bands of the 80s. By this time, Mick Mars had seen years of frustration on the music scene. Near broke and homeless, he decided to put an ad in a local paper called The Recycler. In it, he described himself as loud, rude, and aggressive in need of a band. Tommy Lee and Nikki Six happened to be looking for a replacement for guitarist Greg Leon, who was originally in Quiet Riot and had joined the band. They came across Mick's posting in The Recycler. Mick Mars immediately struck Tommy Lee, with Tommy Lee remarking that he looked just like Cousin It from the Adams Family. The perfect vibe for what they were going for in the LA scene at the time. Mick suggested the name Motley Crue from Harry Clay's earlier inspiration. They played around with the typeset and came up with the spelling and sets of dots over the O and the U. With their name set, they took to the club scene, releasing a single called Stick to Your Guns with a song called Toast of the Town on the flip side. They gave away all 100 copies of it for free at the band's live shows. They recorded demos on Leather Records, which would ultimately shape up to become their debut album, Too Fast for Love. Fast 
which was released on Elektra. They brought in Michael Wagner to mix it originally. Michael had been in the band except, and he would end up producing Skid Row as well as mixing Metallica's Master of Puppets. At the time, the band was making, on average, $20 a week, managed by Andy Kaufman, who was originally a construction worker, and a friend of Mick Mars. The original recordings and mixes had a very raw sound. They were self-produced and recorded at Cherokee Studios in just over three days. Before signing to Elektra, the album sold a total of 20,000 copies. Roy Thomas Baker, who worked with Queen, ended up remixing the songs, giving them a somewhat slicker, more radio-friendly sound for the time. Though by any standard, even the remixes of the album have so much more raw, gritty sound than their later work. Electra dropped Stick to Your Guns and had the band re-record a shorter version of Come On and Dance for the release. The album still managed to retain that raw feel, however. Mick Mars played Les Paul Customs through cranked up Marshall stacks, achieving that buzz-cutting upper mid-range heavy guitar sound. Take me to the top. The album ended up hitting number 77 on the charts and would ultimately go platinum. Mick Mars was really surprised that the album did so well, since he basically considered it a demo. Mick's playing on the album is solid. His rhythms throughout the songs are indicative of a lot of palm muting and double picking as well as arpeggiation. Considering the time, his playing was no doubt influential, as subsequent albums from hard rock to 80s metal thrash all featured a similar approach in later years. Mick Mars's lead work really shines throughout, especially on the track Piece of Your Action, which is essentially a song within a song. In that solo, Mick Mars goes from theme to theme, mixing really simple held out notes to all out minor pentatonic intensity with the last sustained double stops crescendoing in pitch like a race car. <laughs> Mick Mars played what sounded right without worrying about whether the notes fit perfectly in scale or not, and yet it carried all the attitude of a hot-rodded pentatonic or blues scale. When Shout at the Devil came out in 1983, Motley Crue reached new heights. They ran advertising blitzes on regular day-to-day -day TV, which was relatively unheard of at the time, but now they actually had the budget to do something like this. Fully made up with their hair teased two feet off the top of their head, they were a band that looked like they were dragged in by the cat. Mick Mars's raw sound carried through perfectly on this album, only now they were a bit leaner and more polished. Mick's road-tested style was on full display on this album. Unison bends, pentatonic licks for days, and passages moved up and down chromatically adorned the album. <laughs> This was the sound of a band that has finally arrived, and the overall vibe was completely driven by Mick Mars' guitar playing. MTV was big at the time, and Motley Crue did not shy away from making their videos all-out hair metal masterpieces. They also pioneered the feel for a live show, but put into a video format. And of course, with video, in order to get the vibe across, everything must be exaggerated. And Motley Crue never feared bringing those things over the top. By the time 1985 rolled around, excesses showed, as the band had experienced some serious success. Fitz Neil was facing some prison time after losing control of a car he drove, resulting in a car accident that killed Hanoi Rocks' drummer, Nicholas Razzle Dingley. Meanwhile, Nicky Six had gotten seriously hooked on smack and was spiraling out of control. Also during this time, the band was actually contemplating replacing Mick Mars. They approached Jakey e. Lee, who had taken over for Ozzy Osbourne after Randy Rhodes died in a plane crash. They wanted Jake to either play alongside Mick Mars or to replace him altogether. However, Mick Mars had an ace card in his back pocket. His in-laws were still funding the band so Jake was never brought into the fold. Jake and Mick definitely have had their differences during that period, creating a long-standing rift between them. They have since made up, but Jakey e. Lee maintains that he is still the younger, better-looking, and better guitar player than Mick will ever be. However, when pressed, he admits that Motley Crue may not have been as big as they are with Jake at the helm. Released in June 1985, Motley Crue's next album, Theater of Pain, was a huge success, with its hits including the cover of Smokin' in the Boys' Room as well as Home Sweet Home.
However, the album was a huge disappointment to diehard fans. Later, the band would admit that it was a disappointment to them as well, but it found them huge worldwide success and a whole new audience. Gone was the edgy punk vibe of the earlier two albums, and now we're presented with a very slick and clean, almost disembodied production. Still, Mick Mars's guitar intensity shone through, and he drove all of the hard rocking tunes. Motley Crue's next album, Girls, 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 released in 1987, went quadruple platinum. Notably, this album really featured Mick Mars's guitar up front and center. His soloing was extremely intense throughout the album, and he even got to show off some slide on the tune Something for Nothing. His tone on this album is more reminiscent of his sound on Too Fast for Love. Those buzzsaw, hard pan cranked up Marshall stacks to the left and the right with searing leads panned up front and center. While the album had a bit more of a polished sound, it was still raw and guttural like their earlier first two albums and was well received by the more diehard Motley Crue fans. Of course, by this time, drugs were definitely a part of the picture. In December of 87, Nikki Six's heroin use had gotten so bad, he ended up ODing. On his way to the hospital, the paramedic was able to get his heart beating again. When he woke up in the hospital, he walked out, approached some Motley Crue fans who were holding a vigil for him outside, and got a ride home with them. The story has it that once he got home, he had immediately started using again. This wasn't Nikki's first time, however. Years before, he was at his dealer's place, OD'd, and his heart rate was so slow that the dealer couldn't detect his heartbeat. His dealer had used a baseball bat to try to startle him back to life, but to no avail. Nicky woke up in a dumpster hours later. Enter 1989, and Motley Crue comes out with what is their quintessential album during their Vince Neil days, especially with regards to how Mars was featured, Dr. Feelgood. By this time, the band had cleaned up their act and collectively got sober. Mars's rhythms on this album reached a new level of complexity. He was doing a lot of cool polyrhythms. In terms of his guitar sound, it was fully realized and polished on this album, yet maintained its rugged, natural feel. In terms of soloing, Mars went to new heights, incorporating a lot of flash and whammy bar work. Mick exercised full creative license on this one, from the syncopated groove of his playing on Dr. Feelgood to mimicking the sound of the engine shifting gears for Kickstart My Heart, which is the song inspired by Nicky being brought back from the dead after his heart stopped beating. The most notable thing about Mars's work on this album is that he had the amps crank so loud that his guitar ended up bleeding into Steven Tyler's vocal tracks as Aerosmith was recording Pump in the studio next door. They had asked Mars if he might be able to bring it down a bit, but of course Mick did not want to lose the vibe. So yes, Mick Mars made many unintended studio appearances on Aerosmith's Pump album. When 1994 came around, the band had gone through so much inner turmoil. Things were definitely shaken up in the Motley Crue camp after the Dr. Feelgood tour cycle. According to Vince Neil, they are having a whole bunch of little spats as they started work on their follow-up to Dr. Feelgood. Supposedly Vince Neil was distracted by his longtime hobby, car racing, which detracted from his work in the band. Also at this time, the band wanted to try a different musical direction, and the style just wasn't apparently working with Vince at all. In 92, the other guys in the band gave Vince Neil the boot as their frontman. The way Vince told it, he was fired by a FedEx letter, and he felt that it was a pretty cold move after being in the band since day one. To replace Vince, they ended up bringing in John Karabi, who was the former lead vocalist of the band The Scream. For 80s hard rock and metal fans out there who were around during that time, most of them missed the boat because The Scream stood head and shoulders above most of the well-known bands in the day, both in terms of musicianship and songwriting. Sadly, The Scream never could break through to a wider audience, but their recorded work is out there as evidence that there were indeed serious bands making top-notch music during that period. Unlike Vince, John Karabi was less of a glitz and glamour and more of a pure rock singer. Karabi had more of a gritty, blues rock type of voice compared to Vince's signature high-pitched wail. Wow! Very organic and not played at all. On their 1994 self-titled album, 
with Karabi on vocals. Motley Crue went for a completely different direction musically. Their songs were way stripped down and heavy compared to their super slick hair metal jams from the 80s. Mick Mars' tone on this album is what can be best described as organic. Gone was his typical buzzsaw high mid-range sound and in place more scooped with tight lows and a very aggressive attack. Upon a close listen, Mick achieved the perfect tube breakup and amp saturation. Similarly, Tommy Lee's kit was devoid of all the production tricks, and instead you're left with his complete natural sound, showing just how powerful and locked in of a drummer he really is. Tracks like Hooligan's Holiday and Smoke the Sky had this raw, sludgy riffing with Karabi's rough vocals caked in gravel over the top. By the band taking the natural route and letting their sound truly meld with Karabi, they managed to put one single album that proved, at least for a very short amount of time, that Motley Crue could actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the best, hardest-hitting bands of the day. To put it in perspective, Van Halen had their chance when they enlisted Gary Sharon for Van Halen 3, but instead tried to capture more of the sound they had with Sammy, resulting in a recording catastrophe. But Crue did it right with this album by reinventing themselves. Unfortunately, their party music falsetto shriek-loving fans were not having any of it. It also didn't help that Elektra did little to nothing to promote the album. Still, this lineup and recording approach was Mick's perfect vehicle to show in band form what he himself had been bringing to the table all along. The band and, disillusioned with the way things were going, went on a round of mass firings, replacing the manager and producer. They set to work on a new album, originally called Personality No. 9. The band then met with their label head at Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers actually owned Electro Records, which is the label they were signed to, where Warner CEO Doug Moore has really wanted the band to get rid of John Karabi, saying he just wasn't star material, and tried to convince them to bring Neil back into the fold. Tommy Lee and Nikki Six were not having it, and told Morris no way so Doug relented. So they went back in the studio with the goal of making the next album more aggressive than the self-titled Motley Crue album. They had replaced their producer Bob Rock setting him as being way too expensive and overproducing everything. So they replaced him with Scott Humphrey. The only problem was Scott wanted everything his way, diminishing Mars's role in the songwriting process. According to Mick and John Karabi, Mick was very much present and contributing a lot during the recording sessions, but they weren't using his cuts, instead replacing him with studio players. Mick Mars said that the recording of this album, which ultimately would be called Generation Swine, was a low point as the band showed him no respect. Producer Scott Humphrey had put a lot of pressure on John Karabi as well as the rest of the band, and John decided that was enough and he ended up quitting. Vince Neil, meanwhile, had his solo career going on, and he had lost his daughter Skylar, so he was really not in the headspace to get back in the group. The band's new manager, Alan Kovac, was trying to put the whole thing together, so he spent double time trying to convince the band and Neil to reunite. The end result was pretty disjointed. Mick Mars was not given free reign whatsoever to play the way he wanted to. And years later, he would say that he did not play a single note on that album. Mick Mars had written a note to Nikki Six expressing his frustration with being cut out of the songwriting process because Scott Humphrey was afraid of it sounding too guitar laden. In the note, Mick also pointed out that Scott had told Tommy Lee that he himself could do a better job on guitar than Mick. Apparently, the producer didn't feel that Mick fit the bill to make it sound much more in a synthesizer vibe that he was going for. For this album, the band also recorded what was arguably the worst song they had ever done, Brandon, which was this piano-driven orchestral song by Tommy, with the lyrics stating things like, Brandon, you are my son, and your mother gave birth to you. A not-so-cryptic reference to Pamela giving birth to their son, whose name is, you guessed it, Brandon. The band must have had an inkling that their work was cut out for them, so that they were going to have to take extra steps to promote this questionable album. So they came out with Motley Brew. This was a drink that would turn your entire mouth blue when you drank it, with the goal of turning one's urine green when it comes out later on. From first-hand experience, the blue mouth lasts a few hours, and the result was indeed a highly vivid green. Nevertheless, they did have a couple singles, chart, Afraid, and Beauty. Electra Records was officially done with them at that point. The album was released on June 4th, 97. By July, John Karabi actually had a $4 million lawsuit against Motley Crue for breaching their contract as well as for fraud and slander. John said he neither got royalties or credit. He was supposedly responsible for 80% of the material on the album, 
but only got credit for two songs on the original pressing of Generation Swan. In 99, Tommy Lee ended up splitting from the band to work on his own solo projects. Tommy had gotten thrown in jail for domestic violence with his wife at the time, Pamela Anderson. Get out of here. Hey! And so they brought in drummer Randy Castillo, a legend to the scene who had worked extensively with Ozzy Osbourne and a slew of other groups. The band also managed to get rid of Scott Humphrey and brought in legendary producer Mike Klink. It would seem things would look up for Mick, but the situation didn't get any better. Like their last effort, recordings for New Tattoo saw Mick Mars with very little input. He wasn't invited to participate in the writing of any of the songs and claimed to have maybe gotten in one lick on the entire album. But according to Nikki Six, Mick did in fact contribute a lot, having played all the parts, but was addicted to opiates. Nikki Six also contended that Mick wasn't a great songwriter. Mick had been dealing with a degenerative disease called ankylosing spondylitis for decades and had always soldiered through with the painful condition. Sadly, drummer Randy Castillo became ill while the band were preparing to tour behind New Tattoo and died from cancer in 2002. At this point, Motley Crue went on a hiatus. Mars was having a rough go of it, having to undergo hip surgery and dealing with arthritis. Motley Crue reconvened and toured for a while with the original lineup and recorded the 2008 album The Saints of Los Angeles. DJ Oshbaugh was said to have taken the helm for most of the guitar duties for this album, and according to Mick Mars, the band had a constant refrain that he just could not play his parts anymore. Still, Mars's lead work shines, especially on the title track. For this album, Motley Crue did an effective job at modernizing their sounds, and the solos by Mick Mars stand the test of time and fit perfectly with what the band was putting out. But increasingly, Mars's input was being muted by the band. On October 27th, 2022, Mick Mars made a public announcement regarding his retirement from touring with the band. This tough decision came nearly after 42 years of performance due to the severe form of arthritis that impeded his ability to perform on tour. Following this announcement, the band brought in John Five, known for his tenure with Rob Zombie. In an interview with Ultimate Guitar on March 13th, 2023, Carmen Apice, a drummer and friend to Mars, shared insights suggesting that beyond his health issues, Mars had gotten sick of tour. Nikki Six unleashed his fury on Twitter in response, calling Carmen a washed up drummer. This exchange pissed Mars off, and rightfully so. Mick lamented over what he considered a laughable severance package from the band, highlighting that his royalties were reduced to 7.5% as a direct consequence of his retirement. He said that he was pushed from the band, basically canned due to his medical condition, and he said that it wasn't voluntary on his part by any means. The situation escalated on April 7th, 2023, when Mick Mars filed a lawsuit against Motley Crue in the Los Angeles County Superior Court. He accused the band of significantly slashing his touring royalty agreement, which was originally 25% to 7.5% following his retirement announcement. Of course, the band fired back and said that anybody who was going to pull out of touring had to have their royalties reduced. Mick Mars' attorney, Ed McPherson, criticized the band for not disclosing updated financial documents regarding Mars' payout post-retirement. Mars accused the band of bullying him into selling his remaining share of the band. In a subsequent public statement, Nikki Six expressed regret over the lawsuit, but extended his support for Mars. But then Mars dropped the ultimate bombshell by letting it be known that the band were miming their parts on stage. <laughs> Many uploaders took to social media to prove that not only were Nikki Six and Vince Neil miming their parts, but that Mick soldiered through actually playing his parts, even though he was the one with the serious health problems in the group. By July 3rd, 2023, in a Rolling Stone interview, Mick Mars stated that he had ceased communication with the band members and was determined to secure his entitled royalty percentage. The legal battle saw a significant development in January 2024, when a Los Angeles judge ruled in favor of Mars ordering Motley Crue to cover his legal expenses. The judge criticized the band for their delay in producing financial records and other crucial documents, which Mars had sued to access. The judge declared the case legally moot 
since the band ultimately provided the documents in December, would emphasize that Mars was entitled to attorney fees due to the unnecessary litigation prompted by the band's reluctance. For Mick's time in the band and his contributions which make up the bulk of their success, so many people have stepped forward and echoed their support for him. Without Mick Mars, Motley Crue would have just been relegated to another bar band from LA. In 2024, Mars proved to the world that he wasn't backing down. He came out with a solo debut called The Other Side of Mars. He brought in Michael Wagner, who had produced Motley Crue's first album, but now he was free to get back into songwriting again. And he also brought in Ray Losier from Korn to lay down the drums. The production on this one is solid, as is the songwriting. It's a heavy-hitting album that burns from start to finish, and really sounds like the next logical progression from where Motley Crue were originally headed when they recorded their self-titled debut album in 94. The result was a vindication on Mick Mars' part, showing that he too knew when the band sounded its best. So he applied it, and then some, on his solo effort. Gone are the shrieky falsettos of Vince. Powerhouse vocalist Jacob Bunton and Brian Gamboa kicked the album into overdrive. With a solid lineup, routed out by Chris Collier on bass and Paul Taylor from Winger on the keys. By the time Motley Crue had formed... Mick Mars had already been to hell and back. Through the decades, he had dealt with intense health problems and spent many years keeping his mouth shut and his head down, doing his part to support the band and help them be successful. When all those years later, he finally decided to speak up, it took the public by surprise and instantly garnered so much support for him versus the other band members. It had become apparent that the rest of the members had become pretty much caricatures of themselves, yet Mick was able to step out beyond all of that it enabled the public to step back and realize who was the real driving force behind Motley Crue. Mick's diehard fans are looking forward to seeing what else he comes up with. If his latest work is any indication, he should definitely be kicking out some really good stuff in the coming years. Chances are we won't see him touring, but that doesn't mean he'll stop playing, writing, and recording, which is something that he has always loved to do. So if you like what you see here, kindly smack that like button, and while you're at it, hit the subscribe button and join the family. Thank you so much for watching.